There can be a lot at stake on any given hunt. Some people wait decades to draw a premium tag. Oftentimes, there's a lot invested in a hunt, whether it's time, money, or both. It's those make or break moments that separate participation medals from real trophies. Best of the West Arms and Huskama Optics were created by hunters for hunters. A turnkey system that has been highlighted on hundreds of episodes of the Best of the West for the past 20 years. When the hunt of a lifetime depends on the shot of a lifetime, let the Huskama Advantage do the work for you. It's as simple as range, dial, hold, and squeeze. Custom turrets match the ballistic profile of each rifle and account for elevation and temperature, making Huskama and Best of the West rifles the fastest and most accurate hunting systems available. On this week's long-range hunting adventure, we're honored to be following Joe Michaelitz on his desert sheep hunt in Sonora, Mexico with a team from Wade Lemon Hunting. Desert sheep hunting has provided some incredible moments over the years. From Tiburon Island to the Nevada desert, it's always an honor to chase big rams. Friend of the show, Pat Romero, drew his first desert bighorn sheep tag after 20 years of applying in his home state of Arizona. Pat scoured his area for the ram he'd been waiting for. Finally, on day three of his hunt with friends and family surrounding him, Pat made a perfect cross canyon shot and walked up on a dream that was long overdue. That's the ram right there. That's the, one. the best of the West has featured close to a dozen desert sheep hunts over the years. The majority of those hunts have been first ever rams for the hunters involved. Being a part of someone's first step towards the North American Grand Slam of sheep hunting is a unique experience. The pursuit of sheep is often a bittersweet endeavor. Most sheep hunters will attest that nothing beats the feeling of putting your hands on a ram you worked hard for. And in contrast, walking off the mountain empty-handed after a failed attempt of chasing sheep all week is the absolute sh**. Desert bighorn sheep are a conservation success story thanks to organizations like the Wild Sheep Foundation and many other local chapters and affiliates that are committed to putting and keeping wild sheep on the mountain. My name is Joe Michaelitz. I'm out here in the middle of the Sonora Desert working on my uh, desert bighorn sheep. It's been quite a trip out here. A year and a half ago, I shot my first sheep, a nice stone sheep up in British Columbia. That was quite a hunt, quite an experience. This is kind of the extreme opposite as far as climate and weather. It's a beautiful country. It's a lot of cactus. It's real rugged, real rocky. It's not the easiest terrain to navigate. You gotta watch where you're stepping and be careful because you can get banged up pretty easy and, and if the rocks don't bang you up, the cactus will. You know, a trophy ram, you know, as far as judging score and age and everything, we're looking at, at several different things. You know, we're gonna look at, at body size, you know, next to other sheep and uh, body shape, you know, deeper brisket, big pot bellies on these rams. An older ram might have, you know, some, some battle wounds. His nose might be swollen up, the bridge of his nose. We're looking for, for good length, low drop on these, these rams down here. You know, a low drop and a curl up. You know, a lot of people look at length and lamb tips and everything and think that's a lot, but a lot of these desert sheep don't carry them lamb tips. They end up brooming them back. So we're looking at, at mass. You know, you look at your overall length, and then we're looking at the mass. You know, the gap between the horns, that gives you a little bit. Then you look, you know, at the gap, say between the base of the horn and the ear, to see how far that that base of that horn's grown down. That gives you another judging aspect. Obviously, you're looking for length. You want to get get up there in the 30s. You know, you don't want to kill a short ram. Short ram will look real massive, but he's he's real short, and that's not going to add up. Generally, you find an older ram, and and everything, you're gonna you'll be able to tell. You know, the right ram stands up. You look at him, you're gonna say, oh, okay, that's. That's our boy right there. When they turn away from you, you can see how blown out the back of the horn is, you know, how far he carries that mass down real good. And yeah, just a few things we'll be looking for. You know, these sheep down here in Sonora, they're, they're up on the mountains, you know, so we're approaching the mountains from the valleys and, you know, we'll find a good vantage point to glass from. And 
you know, then it's kind of a patience game, you know, just glass and pick apart the mountains real good. And from there you make a plan, you know, plan of attack, a stalk on him, whatever we got to do to, to go after the target animal. You know, sometimes you think you got these sheep figured out and, and then they just, they prove you wrong. You know, you're constantly learning, you, you pick up different things. They, you know, you'll be sitting there watching, you know, a little group of sheep for an hour and they're calm as can be and then all of a sudden one of them will pick their head up and they'll panic and they'll, they'll run 300 yards for, for no reason, just out of the blue, just a real special animal, you know, and you, you don't realize what they are until you actually walk up and, and put your hands on them and you can appreciate, you know, the, the mass on these desert bighorn sheep and, you know, in some of these places we hunt there's like zero natural water, there's, there's nothing there, you know, it'll puddle up a little bit with a rainstorm or whatnot, but there's no springs, no no creeks, you know, just amazing animal, the way they've adapted to survive in this, in this habitat. I really enjoy guiding them. I've helped a lot of people, you know, complete their slams and, you know, you make these memories with these people and, and create these friendships and, and these bonds that, you know, they last a lifetime. That's kind of why I love what I do. Appreciate the opportunities I've got and it's been a dream of mine to do this and I've been blessed and I do this for a living. The desert sheep like restoration program, I guess is what it would be called down here in Mexico, is it's been a huge success. You know, it went from very few animals to the population's huge now. With with reintroductions and transplants and everything, there's there's getting to be a lot of opportunity for desert sheep hunting in, in Sonora. Lots of opportunity. There's a value on these animals. People noticed that the, these animals were getting fewer and fewer and fewer. And, you know, they took notice of that and made some changes and started these different programs and now the opportunity you know with the population just taking off the way it has and everything going so smoothly and great down here for the desert sheep the, the populations are high enough that there's there's getting to be a lot of opportunity for hunting desert sheep in in Mexico. Our lodge here at the Voltadero it's you know it's first class you know we got several rooms we got several you know double rooms uh, it's family friendly husband and wife groups, family groups, you know, whatever. Private chefs, you know, that take care of everybody, cook big meals, fantastic food. Really, really, really comfortable. Not gonna be roughing it down here with us by any means. Yeah, the very first morning, we just took off from, from camp. Uh, we weren't probably hunting 10, 15 minutes and, and Lance stopped and he was like, what is that? And uh, up on the hillside was a feral goat and they don't like feral goats. I guess they carry diseases and different things and, and uh, they can transfer that onto the sheep and they can wipe out the sheep. So he's like, we gotta get rid of that goat. And uh, so we got out and ranged him and I just got down on a knee and there was a fence right there. I just used the fence as a rest and, and um, dialed a 275 on my, on my turret dropped them in his tracks. We took care of that, that potential problem. That was kind of a fun morning, fun way to start the day. So once we started hunting, uh, a lot of glassing, the uh, kind of the southern slopes that the sun was uh, first hitting as it was coming up. I had never seen a desert, you know, bighorn, or I, I haven't seen any of these desert sheep before. I definitely didn't have my eye trained because Lance, our guide, was spotting things and it took me a couple of times to, to look through my binoculars to see what he was seeing. And to me, they just looked like another rock. I couldn't believe they were sheep, but when they would move, you could recognize them. They do have lighter colored butts, so you can see them when they're facing away. But otherwise, you know, as the, as the hunt went on and as we glassed and we found more sheep, I was starting to pick them up a little bit. And it was getting to be, you know, a lot more fun where I felt I was finally contributing to the cause. We got a glimpse of a, of a nice ram, a big ram, uh, on the move, way up on the ridge on the top of the hills. Uh, he stopped, we glassed, we got a good look at him. We knew that was the one that we were, we were after. We climbed up and we, uh, we looked and looked and looked, never could see him again. Uh, as we continued to hunt through the day, we, we really never found him. It got late, so we called it a day and we kind of knew the general area where we wanted to start hunting in the morning. 
didn't sleep the best that night because I was pretty excited. I wanted to see that ram again in the morning. And fortunately, we, we spotted him. But he was on the highest hill, the highest ridge. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Um, we tried a lot of different things, set up on him three different times. But he just was smart. He wouldn't, he wouldn't show himself. He was always behind the rocks, the trees, the brush. He just wouldn't show himself. I got all full of cactus quills and I'm laying on the ground in awkward positions trying to get a shot that's, you know, almost straight up. This wasn't working for us. Hunting in the cactus and hunting in this, uh, this desert is a little different. Especially when you're trying to get shots angling up, you know, you don't, down low there's no rocks or boulders or things to get a rest on. We tried finding trees, little trees that we could wedge the gun in and, and get stable and laying on the ground and putting the rifle on packs and just doing different things to try to, to get where we could get a shot, a uh, stable shot if the shot presented itself. But it was difficult. This, uh, this ram, I don't know if he knew what was going on, but every time we would see him on one side of the ridge, he would keep the brush between him and us and he'd walk over to the other side of the ridge. We'd spot him again. We kind of had to stay back a little bit just so we could see over the brush. And all we could see is maybe his, his head or one of his horns or something. You know, all the while he's five, 600 yards away, almost straight up on the top of this big ridge. So we'd get set up on him and, and wait, and Tell me when you see sometimes him. he'd bed down and we'd wait for him to get up. When he'd get up, we wouldn't have a shot. And then he'd go over on the other side of the ridge. So, so we'd get up and we were just kind of playing a cat and mouse game, you know, just trying to get set up on this ram from one side of the ridge to the other. We just couldn't make it happen. It was getting pretty frustrating. I wasn't sure if I was ever gonna get an opportunity at this ram. We're breaking for lunch and we're kind of trying to decide how we're going to make this happen on this ram. You know, he's kind of made it personal at this point. He's making us look like fools. I had a couple of our other guides, Tyler and, and uh, Stephen. I had them come out and uh, help spot for us, you know, so that we could, you know, you're glassing these mountains from a distance and then you got to move in and then, of course, you know, the closer you get, the worse the brush gets, so you're going to have some long range shooting. Right out of the chute, Tyler spots this ram and we're, we're a long ways out. We pack up and we just decide we're gonna, we're gonna walk across the desert until we get over there and get set up. We head out and we get over there and we get set up. This terrain's not very, not very forgiving. There's not a, lot of, not a lot of stuff to get a rest on, you know. Laying prone, which is a great position to shoot, it's, it doesn't happen a lot on desert sheep, you know, especially down here, because you're hunting from low going up. We're on the bottom and he is on the top, so we're shooting straight up. And we're, we tried the prone thing, we tried to get it set up and it's just, it, it wasn't gonna work, it was a mess. Uh, just with the brush and everything. So we finally, we found a tree. It's got a fork in it, but it's too low, so we, we jam a backpack in this tree. He's got a good elbow rest and everything and it's, it's set up great. We just waited, but we watched him half hour, 45 minutes or better. Uh, the sun was getting you know, pretty low on the horizon. He finally had walked out enough to give me a shot through some brush. You know, the angle was about 450 yards. The wind was kinda, it was gusty. It was, uh, I think the winds were probably 20 miles an hour, gusting more at times. You know, the Huskama advantage on the scope on the turret system, they, it does have a patented wind hold feature as long as you can dope the wind or judge the wind. And sometimes the wind was from the right, sometimes the wind was from the left. I knew it was gonna be a long shot, 500 yards, uh, but it's just kind of like at that moment, the wind just kind of died at the right time. Anyway, I felt stable. I centered the crosshairs, took the shot. I must have hit some brush or something, it deflected the bullet a little bit, it hit low. Anyway, it, it ran right to the top of the, to the rocks, right on the very top of the peak, gave me a really good second shot, which I followed up 
real fast and uh, got on him quick, pulled the trigger, and he didn't act like he was hit. For more information about the products and gear used on today's show, please visit LongRangeStore.com or call 1-866-754-7618. There were a couple guys freed up, and uh, Lance asked if they'd come along and just kind of hang out on the other side of the ridge, just glassing and, and seeing if, if it went over, uh, get a look at it. Where they were set up, you know, they saw what they thought I, I hit it with my second shot. You know, they just saw it kind of behave a little different, you know, kind of shook its head and, you know, wagged its tail a little bit, and then looked like it stumbled down. One of the guys went up to look for blood and the other one just went around farther and was uh, just with the spotting scope, just looking for anything. And he uh, called us and said he saw one horn and a leg sticking up in the rocks. <laughs> so I was pretty elated, uh, took the pressure off. It's, I was pretty excited that uh, I got that ram. The Huskama system with the wind hold on the turret, not only do you just dial for, uh, for elevation, but it, it, it also has little numbers on, on it that will tell you, uh, based on the shooting system, you know, the, the ammunition you're shooting through that rifle, uh, what the wind drift will be. And it's, I know it's helped me a lot in the past uh, because um, if you can learn how to judge the wind, of course the systems do come with a wind meter. That's a great way to, to learn how to judge the wind. But if you can judge the wind and get it close, uh, it's, it's just spot on. And um, out here, you know, the wind was pretty windy. It was more calm in the morning. The winds would pick up during the day, and it just always changed based on where you were at. So it really didn't matter. I just kind of got lucky. I was going to hold for wind. Two, three minutes, two and a half minutes is kind of what I was going to hold for wind uh, based on what the turret was telling me. But again, the wind died right when I was ready to make my shot, and I just first time I think I've shot an animal long range where I held the crosshairs right on it. So it all worked out. Of course, then the, the real work starts because we have to go straight up almost 500 yards to get to them and it's all boulders and crazy terrain and finally getting up there. You know, I was pretty exhausted, but I was, I was gonna get up there. And um, I remember just kind of turning this corner and I could see the, I could see the ram maybe 30 yards away and my heart just started pumping and I was, uh, I was just really excited. When, when I, I got to him and I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was. I mean, the color, the fur, uh, you know, the, the horns, the mass, the weight, and then just thinking about where we were, it was beautiful. We just kind of took it in for a while. You know, we we're, we we're way up on top of the highest hill in the whole area. You know, we had the sun setting behind us and it was my second ram. So I'm trying to get my slam, and I have two down, two to go. I uh, probably had the best guide in camp. Everybody told me, oh, you're gonna be hunting with Lance, and Lance is definitely a stud of a guide. So uh, he did an unbelievable job. Great people, great experience. It was just in a beautiful place at a beautiful time, and it just all came together. I, I really can't put it in words. It was just awesome. Thanks for watching this episode of The Best of the West. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the latest long-range hunting adventures.